Welcome everyone, good evening. We are calling the special meeting to order on Monday, March 2nd, 2020. We're in the council chambers. We're here to listen to our outside agencies tonight. And we've given you a whole five minutes each, if you're here, maybe longer. So uh, it is 545, and should I just go by the list, or do you want, want me to? Yeah, there was a list the agenda, uh, I first. Yeah, sorry about that, I actually have that. So I'm, we have a list of, I'll just call it in order. And first up is Kite, Chris Camo. Welcome. Hey guys, welcome. Oh, thank you. Just name and title and the floor is yours. Sure. Welcome. Thank you, good evening. Um, my name is Chris Gamo, and I am the um, coordinator for Enfield Kite. Um, Hi, and I'm Leanne Bolio, and I am the chairperson for Kite and the School Readiness Council, where the Kite and the School Readiness Council are combined. Um, so Kite is Enfield's early childhood collaborative and serves as the town's School Readiness Council. As such, we oversee the school readiness grant application process and related reporting. Uh, it is a great pleasure that we work with Amy Morales from the Family Resource Center as our liaison to the School Readiness Council. We value our partnership with the Town of Enfield. Um, as the School Readiness Council, we convene the monthly collaborative um, meetings. So much of the work that Kite does in the town of Enfield and how we delegate staff time in the Kite office is based off of information that we get from the town and the school district. One example of the work that Kite does is in the area of young children's mental health. Kite, based on the need, uh, being seen by Enfield kindergarten teachers and early education providers, has taken the lead to connect schools, pediatric practices, providers and mental behavioral health specialists. And this collaboration um, resulted in the identification of resources and development of systems to meet the needs of the growing number of children who are coming to school exhibiting challenging behavior as a result of being exposed to trauma and toxic stress. Um, Kite has uh, traditionally over the years been able to bring the pediatric practices together um, we have done that several times um, where they are able to come together and share and communicate resources and ideas. Uh, most recently, we formed the Enfield Early Childhood Mental Health Committee, and as such a result of this, gave Dr. Kalnan, um, who I know he was here um, with Child First, talking about that new resource that's available to um, Enfield families. Um, so, A lot of the work that they do um, is uses the um, a trauma-informed lens, and so as a result of this, we have brought together um, a series of professional development opportunities for early care and education providers, as well as Enfield Public Schools, and we've also extended those workshops um, and that what what um, the work that they're doing in those professional development opportunities uh, to families. Um, some of the other things that, that Kite has been um, very fortunate to be part of is um, the work with 2Gen um, and most recently the work with Alice. So the support that you give us uh, allows us the opportunity to bring people together to begin to understand 2Gen work and issues affecting our community, such as Alice. So through these conversations, we can create foundations on which the community together can move forward. Um, so those are a few of the, the um, work areas that we have been currently working on. Um, a, a good focus, a good um, part of our time is also focused on um, the, um, the work in, the, in, in schools and in the community around um, the best way to instruct yeah, very young children. And, and I guess I also want to say part of what Chris was talking about is the mental health. And we, we, are, we are privileged um, to be part of um, the larger Enfield work around um, tr 
trauma and its impact on students in our schools. And KITE is, our focus is really on all of the areas that really impact very young children. So Chris and Amy um, Whitbro from KITE um, sit on and work in conjunction with Jean Hoy in the work that she is doing as well. So we're able to, to bring that together. The other thing that we've done um, and are continuing to do is really best practices in general for working with very young children. Um, and obviously we're doing um, a, a great deal of work with the schools, but we've also worked with the Enfield Child Development Center and continuing to work with them and also with the uh, private um, providers um, that are part of our community as well, who really don't have the funds to be able to do this work for themselves. So we are able to bring that to them as well, as well as families. So part of all of this, and you know that there's really no way to talk about any one of these things without also talking about the families that are impacted, whether it's um, school readiness, trauma, whatever it is. And so whatever work is being done that touches the lives of children and that we're do working with the providers and the educators, we're also bringing that support to families as well. And so, for example, Peg Oliveira is doing a whole initiative with our community, um, with schools, with, uh, again, um, some work with the Enfield Child Development Development Center, and we are also bringing her in to be able to do work with families too. How do you, how do you, how do any of us as parents really help protect and strengthen our children um, from all of the stressors that face them in 2020, and um, allow them to be able to grow and flourish in our community? So, thank you. Uh, if you could, real before, real quick, explain a little bit more about Alice and what the goals are. And then, and, and, and also the connection to, so what's some of the trauma? So I understand you're being generic, but what are the, some of the things that we're working on that we're seeing so folks realize that, again, there is stuff going on and, we're, and we are addressing it? So the work, um, I'll start with the trauma work, um, based on some of the, I, I remember back when Leanne was um, a principal and part of KITE many years ago, there was a, um, there was a large discussion based around the KITE table about um, the number of children that were entering kindergartners, kindergarten that were really struggling. Um, and so whatever trauma that is, whether it's trauma at home, it comes in many different forms. They were coming to school and they just weren't ready um, to sit and to learn. And there were so many bigger things going on. And those conversations really started um, the work um, we had done on executive function. Um, we had gone to a training, a three to three training, and bought that, brought that work back to Enfield. Um, as a continuum of that work, we started to work with Peg, like Leanne had mentioned, and she um, just talked about, you know, this the behavior that there's that teachers are seeing in the classroom and that parents are seeing at home, and we thought that there was a great opportunity to kind of provide uh, professional development for teachers and early care providers, as well as supporting families through workshops, which, which we have done. So that has been something that we have, um, we had started and we are continuing that work. We actually have two um, opportunities coming up, one this week is a professional development for early care providers. Um, and that is, um, uh, trauma-informed practice that can benefit all children. And then we will be t following up with the same type of workshop geared towards families. That would be in March 19th, and that is helping families build supportive environments for young children. So based on that need, um, we that was th that we were seeing and we are hearing about, we s were able to support through an opportunity to have PEG come to Enfield. So, so, and that was a good question about, I mean, what does the trauma, what does trauma look like? People throw that around all, all right. the time. So, you know, one of the things that's happening is that um, we're, we are, we're learning more and more through the study of brain science. And part of what we're learning is that, um, that divorce, um, illness, uh, death of a family member, economic insecurity, work insecurity, home insecurity, all of those things over time create changes in the way a child learns and behaves. And it's, it's basically, it's a, it's a physical brain function um, that, that is changed because of that 
kind of ongoing. It doesn't even have to be an event, but you know, we all know those families in our community, and we're very aware of all those families in our community who are experiencing economic um, economic stress. You know, they're working two, three jobs. Um, they're just keeping their head above water. But the jobs that they're taking are, t are. I mean, that's that's really there. It's it's just how do I subsist? Not how do I flourish, but how do I subsist? How do I pay the bills? And that kind of um, constant tension in a home, you, you know, we, we think that we're protecting our children and it's something that they sense, that they're emotionally connected to. And so those kinds of things over time really begin to impact how a child behaves and how they learn. So when we talk about trauma, it's not, it's not always that one catastrophic event, but really it is kind of an ongoing um, stressors in the home. I mean, it's hard enough for us as adults to deal with that, and we've all lived through those things. Um, but we're learning better ways of helping children to do that in schools and in the community. Sorry for the time. Oh, but no, no worries. Yeah. Any yeah. questions from anyone? Councilman Sparraza. Good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. Okay. Yeah. Um, I remember very clear when Dr. Callan was here, my concern and what I, the question I put to him was, early intervention with young children is vital. And we probably do the best we can to identify these households. But I asked Dr. Calvin, and I'd like to ask you, do we have anything on the drawing board to collaborate with our local police department? <coughs> because if anybody is in a position to see trauma, it's, it's those people. And this isn't a criminal thing, this is more of what resources in the community? Maybe people aren't aware. Is there any contact between you and the police department? So not specifically to, That's a great idea. that is a great yeah. idea. So we, um, we actually partnered with the police department. Um, we had a, an event called Playground Tuesdays this past summer and each, each um, event was held at a different playground in different um, parts of the community. And we asked community partners to come out and to play with the families and the children that were out there. Um, and, and so we, d we have had that little bit of a connection, but furthering the connection in the way that you um, just suggested is a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Councilman Bosco. I'm gonna ask you the same question I'm gonna ask everybody sitting here. What is your percentage of savings to your operating budget? So how much do you have in a fund balance of an additional monies that you got there to your savings account compared to what you what it costs to run your organization? Yes. So um, we I guess what I, where I'm going is is at this point here it's going to be really a need thing for people. We got more money than what we really have. So you know how much you really need it. If you have savings, you may not need as much. Yeah, we, um, so the funding for Kite is really dependent. We depend really on on um, the town or the schools and, and um, foundations that private find foundations to fund Kite. So each year that looks a little different. Um, this year we lost some funding that we had had in previous years from Lego. But that's okay. What is your percentage you have in savings to your operating budget? Because if, if you lost money, that's even more the reason maybe to, yeah. to give you something. But if you have a big war chest in the bank, you may not need it this year. You may need it next year more. Right, so right. So that, that's, where, that's where I want to know what the percentage, right. and if you can't give that to me tonight, if you just get it to the town manager, because I'm going to ask everybody the same question. Yeah, I would like to do that. I would like to get that to you so that right, I'm sure. With you know, what really, I'm this is this. These things are really for need. You know, if someone doesn't really need, maybe they don't need the whole thing. Maybe they need a piece of it, but it's really for need. So if you lost funding, well, that makes you, puts you higher on the food chain than someone that has a huge bank account. So, uh, and to be fair, we will ask every single person up here what that percentage is sure i'd be happy to get that for thank you. you thank you so i know we went over five minutes anything else in closing go right ahead um no just we'd like to thank you um for your continued support um not just uh through the money through the social services grant but the continued partnership that we have with so many um 
from the town, whether the Family Resource Center, um, Youth Services, the Department of Social Services. Um, we appreciate that and all of your participation in all of our events, whether it's our annual meeting, any of our community conversations, um, it is very much appreciated. So thank you. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you very so much. If they got more than 7 to 10 percent of their, their conference of their thing, they don't need any money. Our friends from Lowe's and Fishes, come on up. Oh, am I, am I right? Yes, sorry. I'll make sure I fight you. Come on up. Welcome. Hi. How you doing? Fine, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Just make sure that's on, that light's on. You're, I, good. You're good. Thank you. Just name and title, and the floor is yours. Welcome. Okay. My name is Priscilla Brayson, and I'm the director of Enfield Loaves and Fishes Soup Kitchen. And I've been uh, with, as a director and with them for 33 years. And we uh, opened up in 1982. And we're open 363 days a year. This past year, we did over 90,000 meals. We gave to the educational resources for children 27,000, over 27,000 snacks. We also cook community dinners. Sometimes it's once a month, sometimes it's twice a month. And that is uh, where the families get together with the children and they enjoy a nice meal and they have other activities during that time. This past Wednesday, the 26th of February, we cooked 250 meals for them, uh, which was held at Asnunta Community College. Enfield Loaves and Fishes just doesn't just feed people. It's a lot more than that. It's a place where the homeless can go. It's a place where people who have substance problems or mental problems, or it can be a place where a man has lost his wife and he's never cooked. And it's a place for him to come, meet new people, and begin to heal. And I would say Enfield Loaves and Fishes is a place to heal. We have many people that are broken that come to the soup kitchen. And I really believe, as my dad taught me as a child, not only to eat, but also to fish, to feed yourself. And for the 33 years that I've been there, I really believe that I've listened to my dad. And I work with the people there. And I break bread with them. I stay at the meal with them so they can talk to me. And they become trusting with me and understanding. And I can, once someone trusts you and understands you, then, then they open up to you. And then you can direct them. And then you can help them. And actually, they can help themselves. When they become homeless, they come to the soup kitchen. And if they work for me, I open up at 10 AM. I'll feed them breakfast. I'll feed them lunch. I'll feed them supper. I'll give them clothes. And without them realizing them, I'm teaching them a job. So they can go out there and be, sustain themselves in the future. I hope that you get an opportunity to read my annual report this year, because I had a young lady that really opened up to me. How she had a terrible event in her life, lost her home, lost her child, was stealing at Shaw's to live, to eat. She came to the soup kitchen because someone recommended it. that was a place she could eat. I gave her a gift certificate to get her nails done. She looked at her hand and she thought how pretty it was. And she said to me that was the beginning of her recovery, that she didn't have to steal anymore because she got free food at the soup kitchen. And with CHR, she was able to talk it out and get back on track, and she's been clean for four years. 
We work with the community. We partner with all the community in town here with social service, with the Felician Sisters, the Little Sisters, Mark Twain, uh, Five Cupboards, Suffield, Food Shelf. So we all work together to make this community better for the people that are in need. Each and every one of you are one paycheck away from being homeless. And I'm sure if you dig deep in your family, you may have some of your family that are homeless or need a little help in hand. Why am I here? I have requested a small grant from the town, $5,000. This year, we need to get a sterilizer, which is a little over $7,000 because ours is on its last leg, the door doesn't close, and it's spitting oil occasionally on the dishes. We also need a Bay Marie. And many people say, what's that? It's a sandwich maker. And we use it to put it on the front line to keep the salads cold and the drinks cold, or the desserts or whatever that we may need to, to serve. One other thing is the health department has changed temperatures. That's why we have to get a Bay Marie. Ours was donated to us, uh, and it reads around 45, and it's supposed to be 41 degrees. Uh, the ice machine is too small now, because now the health department wants you to have everything on ice when you're serving. Well, that was OK. The amount of those three items is $13,000, and we budgeted those items to be able to purchase them. But then the health department says, no, can't get them. Not till we give you permission. I said, why? We want you to have a hand sink behind the line. Hand sink? But we got one in the kitchen. Well, we want you to have one behind the line. Is it mandatory? Yeah, it's mandatory. So I called a couple of people to help me out to find out, do we really need this? Because the plumbing for that, are you ready? $7,000, almost 7000 And that's plumbing probably from here to you, Michael. It's, it's a short, maybe even shorter. So now we're talking seven, three, over $20,000. We didn't budget $20,000 for this. We budgeted the 13000 In our budget, I kind of took a quick peek, it's, it's $203,000 a year. And I don't know, I'm not the treasurer, so I can't give you what you asked for. So that's why I'm here. I try to be self-supporting. I don't receive federal money, and I don't want it. The door can close tomorrow with federal money. And I don't receive state money. We open like Jesus. Your door is open, we feed you. And somebody asked me, social service, do we feed out of Enfield? We don't refuse anybody. If you're hungry, we feed you. Whether you come from Windsor Lock, Suffield, it doesn't matter. You're there for a reason. And as a nun told me once, you can be the richest person in the world but you can be very poor when you don't have anybody to talk to. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Any questions? I, I do. Yeah. Sorry. Councilor Mangini. Thank you, Priscilla. Appreciate it very much, all your hard work. I just have one <coughs> question. I'm noticing you, you're, you're only requesting a $50 increase from last year? No, it's the same increase, it's the same. So you're not looking for an increase? No, I'm not. Oh. Okay. No. Um, <clears throat> how will you be able to purchase your new machines? We have the money to purchase the machines. It's in our budget. Okay. So there's, you're not looking for additional funding? No. Other than the fact uh, to help us out with the mandated hand sink that needs to be put behind the line. You know, and probably I hate to say this because it's going to be on TV and all that, but you know, I can't, for one hour serving, I can't see anybody taking their gloves off to turn around and wash their hands again. But I'm not the health department. 
It's a requirement, and I have to be obedient. Thank you. I, I appreciate your work. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I come to you because I enjoy your cooking, too, by the way. <laughs> it's very good. Very well said, by the way. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilman Bosco. Yeah, Priscilla, as you know, I, I was the one that pushed for you yes. many years ago. So I, I don't want anyone, any of the people here thinking that I'm trying to um, not give them what they need. But the problem is, real, real, realistically, we have to do this on a most need basis. So if you can get that number to the town manager's office, you know, when your treasurer uh, is in, at least that'll help. And uh, from what I, what I did with quick math, that's 24 people a day you feed on an average. Is that one meal a day, two meals a day, or how, mm -hmm. how does that usually work out? We have more people towards the end of the month, and we cook every day for 100 people. Uh, or a hundred meals because some people come up for seconds and some people come up for thirds Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you Priscilla. Thank you very much Moving on to Enfield people for people Monica Wright and Lorraine Creedon, please come up if you're here That's Welcome. Just make sure the light's on. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Lorraine Creedon. I'm the treasurer for Enfield People for People. Oh, this is our fifth year of operation. Um, we have a, a minimalist budget. <laughs> Uh, just covering the needs of, of what we what we do throughout the year our funding is provided by churches businesses uh, local organizations as well as 95 individual and family donations in the last year uh, we have decided to stay open 100 nights this year that's 25 nights longer than in the past um, and we're looking for support from the town of Enfield in order to maintain that level of being open the coldest parts of the season from January, February, and all of March and into the first part of April. Um, this, we have closed earlier. In one year, we lost somebody who was not able to house themselves after um, the, the warming center closed. So looking to the town, it's, it's an acknowledgement of the need as well as the uh, the presence of us here mm -hmm. that we are important to you just like you're important to us and that monies donated by you will be used to extend the season and hopefully we want to also extend the times that we're open from 7 we're open now from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. we would love to be in a place where we could open a little earlier in the evening before people are sheltered and trying to find places to be um, and in the morning at 7 o'clock when they have to leave. Right now they're on our doorstep at 7 o'clock and we can't let them in until 9 o'clock at night. They are leaving here at 7 o'clock in the morning and the buses aren't picking them up till I think it's like 7.30, quarter of 8. Yep. Yeah. So they're outside at those times. So um, that that's our hope is that that with um, the support of the town, we can use those funds to do more, as well as the recognition by the businesses and other organizations in town that you're behind us as well. And we are just hoping that we will be able to do that. And Mr. Bosco, I could tell you that we have no savings. And that's what I want to None at all. Right. Not that I want to hear <laughs> we're, we're, we're developing a, a capital, but we're hoping to develop a way of, of building funds so that we can, can do more, but we haven't gone, gotten to that point yet at this point in time. Monica wanted to address. Hello. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Monica Wright, the director of Enfield Safe Harbor Warming Center. Just want to say that we have increased our numbers this year. So far, as of March 1st, we have had 40 people come through our door. We can only accommodate 16, so it's a good thing that they all 
do not come in at one time or we would have to turn people away. Um, I look at the grant money as a way for us to not only um, hire people so that we can open early, but now that we are working with CHR and with uh, Department of Social Services here in Enfield in regards to the grant, where it, w it would be nice to open up the doors earlier so CHR can get a chance to get in and to speak to our guests and have our guests counted so that they can get the resources that they need. That's one of the um, challenges that we have because it's hard for our guests to get in touch with the resources that they need. And to have this money, it helps us to have a staff go in at 7 o'clock in the evening so they can meet with someone from CHR, so they can get into the actual system for homelessness, have their CAN assessment, and so that they can start to receive what they need. Another thing I like to say is that, you know, we provide transportation every night for them to come and go uh, in the form of uh, tokens and monthly bus passes because we know that we're far away from them. Most of them come from here in Thompsonville. We're in Hazardville, but we want to make sure that they get to us so that they don't have to stay out in the cold, which is a big expense. We also offer them snacks. We offer them a place to lay down so that they can just stay warm, so that they can be safe. These are costs that you know cost us with operation because we're going the extra mile for them. Uh, one of the things is, is that if we didn't have what we had here, in Enfield, we would have to send our people out to Hartford. We'd have to send them out to Middletown. We'd have to send them out to Meriden. And our thing is we keep take care of what, who we are and what we have here. So that's what we're looking for when we ask for that. So we can serve our people here. Not that, you know, and we're part of the 211 system. So when 211 calls us and says we have one of your residents who have called us and needs somewhere to stay, I can say our door is open, just send them to me. Thank you. Very good, good job. Councilman Spraza, then Councilman Mangini, then Councilman Bosco. Thank you for coming. Certainly you do important work, no question about it. But You're welcome. You've been around five years? Five yeah, years, six. yes. And maybe I'm reading this wrong. Is this the last year you didn't come to the town for any monies? Is this the first time? No, we came last year. We did attend last year. We did not receive any funding last year. What did you year. ask for last year? Last year uh, we asked for $10,000 on the recommendation of your social services department. Okay. And just, cause, just so I understand, the $7,500, you have volunteers at the shelter, but you also have paid staff also? Or no? We do have paid staff. Most of our staff is volunteered, but we do have paid staff because we need to have paid, trained people to be there. Our volunteers are there to help us out, but you have to have people who have been trained, who are able to work with people who are homeless, to work with people who have addiction issues, and to also work with people who may have other issues such as mental health. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Jean and Councilman Bosco. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for putting through your application. I'm happy to see this. Um, you provide a well-needed uh, service for our town, and I applaud your efforts. Thank you. And want to ask you to please continue doing the good work that you do. I support you 110 percent. Thank you. And we're and, and we're not going to stop. We're here. Good. We're here to stay. We're here you, for you our homeless people. Provide a here valuable here. service for people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Councilor Bosco. How many people you average a night? <laughs> So we have been averaging 14 to 16 people a night. I'd like to say too that one of the, the changes that's have, that we see, there's a shift in who's utilizing our services. We have more females this year who are utilizing the warming center and we have more uh, females who are over the age of 60 
who are utilizing the warming center because they're living in their cars at this time and the fear of being out there in the car at their age. So that's another reason why, you know, it, it, it would be really important to open our doors up early when we uh, see more of a number of females and older females who are looking to us to utilize our services. Councillor Muller? Right. Yes. Yeah. Councilor Ungar, then Councilor. I thank you for coming here tonight. Um, I was just wondering, um, your guests, do you have an idea where they come from, like Massachusetts area, or are they all pretty much local? No. Our guests are local guests. Um, not to say that we don't have people who come from maybe Summers, who come from maybe Windsor Locks. We do allow them to stay, but the turnover is like no more than 72 hours because we need to have our space available for our residents here at Enfield. Like I said before, our numbers have grown. And it's a good thing that they, they don't all come at the same time or we would have to close the door and turn them away. But we do. And, and it's just so people will not be in the cold, but it's for me to make sure that if they're from Windsor Locks, they get into the Windsor Locks system. If they're from Massachusetts, that they need to go back to the Massachusetts system. Councilor Kiner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, what troubles me is that when 7 o'clock rolls around, uh, you say goodbye to these people. And I'm just wondering, you know, what kind of counseling is, is done, is provided uh, to help these people maybe find a job, find a, a, an educational opportunity? I mean, to see these people leave at 7 o'clock. I mean, I've gone to the town library, and I've seen people asleep in the library and that's no place for them to be but they need a place to go um, are you working on some provisions to, uh, to to find another place where these people can go after seven o'clock and also counsel them that's a good question and, so, and, and one of the challenges was is that because we're here in Enfield there's not much going around here north for homeless that our people were not being counted First of all, because we open at 9 o'clock, we close at 7 o'clock, most businesses are 9 to 5. By the time 7 o'clock in the morning rolls around and we send them out the door, they're either at the library or there are other places, and by that time, they're not able to get where they need to go. So it's a good thing that we are working with Department of Social Services here in Enfield, as well as CHR, so we can make sure that our people are counted for so they don't have to be out at 7 o'clock in the morning not doing anything but we know that they're either going to a program they're going to an appointment they're going to some kind of meeting where we can get them in a place to become self-sufficient so yes and and every night I do work with them I do make sure that they know the resources that are available to them I do let them know that if they need anything that we can call 211 we can call you know the area soup kitchens or wherever they need to go for a resource. So we do work with them too, just to make sure that we don't see them next year. I just, I just wonder how successful you are in providing that kind of counseling so that these people do not come back again. Do you keep some, some kind of a record of, of people and they come back and they tell you, Monica, we've got a job, we're doing this, and thank you very much for, you know, for getting us through this tough time. Yep. So we have, we have how, we have helped house what, maybe like three since our five years have opened. We've had guests come in who were out of jobs, who some were just out of um, jail, incarceration, who we've helped um, get jobs here in the area. We also have like three years ago, we had a couple come in who was sent to us from Hartford because Hartford had no room. So as of today, that couple is housed, they're married, and they just had their second child. So we do work with them so that they can become self-sufficient. So it's kind of like more than a warming center where we go above and beyond. We just had another one of our guests who was a longtime guest since we opened up on the first day, who's now a resident at Mark Twain. So we really do aggressively work with the resources and with the people who we serve to make sure that they get what they need. It's just now really getting in the system. And again, I say that we work with Department of Social Services, 
with Cynthia CHR because we want to make sure that our people are taken care of. Thank you, ladies, for what you provide for our community. It's appreciated. Thank you. So I know we're running late on time, but just two quick questions. Yep. So if, if we could, the amount of money that you get from religious organization, I know St. Mary's is donating a spot, but, but that's where I want to see. I'm not afraid of donating, but I'm sorry, the religious organization should be giving more or matching what the town is doing. Because I think it is, again, they don't pay taxes in town. We open up many, we have many good religious organizations in town. And so I'd like to see how many are donating currently and how many more we can get. And I'd like to challenge those organizations if they're not donating and the town's willing to put up some money to help, they should be meeting us on this. Yeah. That's, and I, that's my only thing when it comes, we have a lot of beautiful buildings in town that are now no longer paying taxes. They should be helping us with this, in my opinion. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. We have 10 churches that are currently active um, and making uh, contributions to the warming center. Uh, Holy Trinity houses us yep. at no fee. Um, and uh, they do make a substantial, the, I would say they pay the bulk of so, what we've so been like we using break so down far. That possible and, I can, yeah, yes. That'd be great. And then my only thing, the, the story you just told about some of the things you've done, we need to, can we see that? You know what I mean? And that's the stuff that we never hear, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's the good stuff, right? So that justifies the donation from the taxpayers because to your point, you know what? We're not just handing out, we're actually trying to make them teach them how to fish, as someone said earlier. Right, we never exactly. get that, inf at least a person, I'm just saying I don't see it. That'd be great to hear. Mm -hmm. So people realize there is a return on the investment because guess what? Our goal is to make you, an, uh, again, go back and be a productive member of society and live your life the way you want to live it. I mean, that's the stuff, if we can get that information, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay. That, and, and again, I, I would like to challenge any religious organizations that aren't currently participating that they get a hold of you folks pretty quickly. That would just be my recommendation through you to them if they're listening. That's on our to-do list. Yeah. All right, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you coming. Good job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, CHR. Welcome. Okay. This is the red, red buttons on, name and title, and the floor is yours. Okay, Go ahead. great. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you very much. Yeah. Uh, I'm Maureen McGuire. I'm Vice President for Communications, Business Development, and Marketing at CHR. And I just want to start by thanking you sincerely for the continued support we've received through the years. It is deeply appreciated. Um, so CHR calls Enfield home. We were founded here uh, 54 years ago. And we started off as a small counseling center and have grown through the years to meet the needs of the children, families, and adults that we serve. CHR is now the most comprehensive behavioral health care agency in the state. And we provide a range of services, some of which you've heard about tonight. Um, we're very proud um, of the housing support services that we provide individuals. We provide supported employment to help people uh, gain new skills and become self-sufficient. And the core of our business is mental health and addiction services, again, for people of all ages. And it's a real continuum of services depending on people's needs. So for some people, it's outpatient care. For some people, it's much more intensive. It's residential care and that type of thing. And my two colleagues will talk a little more about that. In the last year, um, CHR served 27,000 individuals uh, throughout the region, um, including 2,756 individuals from Enfield. Um, but actually, we're just we're always continuing to grow. We're always continuing to add new programs again to meet the needs of the people we serve. In the last year, we were very proud to start offering family medicine, so that's primary care services for our adult clients. Uh, people with serious mental illness tend to die 25 years earlier than the general population, so we're very committed to bringing primary care to our clients and thrilled that we're now doing that in Enfield. We also um, added new services for veterans. Uh, System-wide, we're seeing a 50% increase in the number of veterans and their families who are receiving behavioral health services. Um, we've added some new programs for children that my colleague will talk about. And we continue to see just an alarming number of people who need help um, with opioid use addictions. Um, 
in, as I mentioned, um, in this past year, CHR served 27,000 individuals. That's about a 42% increase since 2015. And that, if you think about it, is about the same time that the opioid use epidemic started. Not all of that increase is related to opioids, but a lot of it is. Um, so while we continue to see a tremendous demand for our services, um, we are requesting, we're respectfully requesting flat funding. It's been flat funding for the past several years because we are respectful of the many demands um, on the council and on the town's budget. Um, so we look forward to working with you and I'm gonna introduce um, Sharon Patron who is Welcome. with the adult services for CHR. Hi, I'm Sharon Patron. I'm the Senior Program Director. I oversee the Enfield Outpatient Clinic as well as our um, Pathways Methadone Clinic. Um, large focus of our um, services this past year has been to try and help with the opiate um, epidemic. We are now serving um, folks through the methadone clinic. We provide buprenorphine and we provide Vivitrol, um, all to try and meet um, medication-assisted treatment for our clients. Um, we also provide, you know, a large range of mental health and addiction services through family, individual, group. We have an intensive outpatient program that provides services um, each day for folks to come in and get services. Um, <clears throat> we also work with the um, uh, the town in the opiate task force. We're part, we participate in that as well. And we also work with the um, police department in terms of the CIT and trying to work with folks that, you know, chronically have involvement with the police department and how we can work better and work with them cooperatively. Um, so we've, you know, we work this is my home. This has been, you know, my home for 33 years working. <laughs> and, um, you know, we really appreciate the support that we get because a lot of our clients are in all of um, the town. So, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I've, I meant to mention that, that about 70% of our clients are low income. They're extremely vulnerable. Um, you know, that represent the, per the percentage of clients who are on Medicaid. So there's an extreme need. Hi there, um, I'm Kathy Shizzle. I'm the Senior Vice President for Child and Family Services. And um, I do wanna also highlight that we do serve um, folks from Enfield regardless of their ability to pay. We have sliding fee as well as many of our services just don't get reimbursed adequately through insurance payment or through our state funding. Um, in, for child and family, we have the full continuum of behavioral health and substance use services. I'm running the gamut from crisis services to outpatient to support services. And we do a, a lot of intensive home-based services for youth here in town, where we have teams that actually go out into the community, school, home, and work with families and youth. We take a focus that's really family-focused. So even though the youth may be our identified individual that we're working with, we really work to assess all the needs in the family. And because we have the full continuum of ages, we can link them to services at CHR and also to services in the community. Um, as you've heard mentioned, um, our organization a couple times in presentations. Um, one of the new programs that we um, launched this past year is um, we enhanced the services that we're providing through the North Central Multidisciplinary Team, which is a team of law enforcement, prosecution, mental health, medical, um, as well as victim advocacy services that work with families where there's been a disclosure of sexual abuse or serious physical abuse. And what we started doing in the past year is really going out to these families, um, not just reviewing them in team, but going out and doing an assessment of the full, um, of the entire family with the recognition that essentially caregivers um, as well as siblings and family members when there's been a disclosure of abuse um, struggle um, as, as um, oftentimes as much or as the youth that actually disclose the abuse. And um, what we're doing with that program is giving um, free uh, treatment to the family, as well as really being involved over a longer period of time to make sure that families who um, 
to make sure they're educated around trauma and the impact of abuse on, on the child and their functioning going forward, but also to make sure they continue with the treatment recommendations. Because oftentimes, when families are in the throes of that disclosure, they have so many people in their home talking with them that as time goes on, they just want to be left alone. And oftentimes, that's not the best approach. Um, so that team really is going in and really wrapping services around the families. Um, and just, I, just curious, yeah. how would you get a referral on, on a potential abuse or t between DCF and yourselves? How does that work? DCF is involved in our team, so we automatically, any cases in Enfield, and, and our multidisciplinary team does cover five towns. Um, but Enfield is one of our largest, right. and um, DCF comes to the table. They have to screen all the cases where there's disclosure, as well as the police department brings those cases to the table in order for us to talk as a team about them. Um, any youth that also go to the Child Ag Advocacy Center in Hartford um, um, come automatically to the team for review also. We just you know, acknowledge that in order to expect those families to get their treatment in Hartford, far away. We wanted to have the ability to offer the care mm -hmm. in the local community because that travel is a barrier. Um, so the friendly hand office or so someone mentioned earlier with Kite, right? So I'm always I'm still always trying to get my mm -hmm. hand my head around the friendly handoff, right? For example, Kite, there's the Alice program where they're trying to get yep. people self sustaining. Sure. And part of the problem with Medicaid you mentioned is that an individual actually gets promoted or gets a job. Well if their child needs medication, Medicaid may take the money away from medication, which makes zero sense. Absolutely. So, how does it work? I mean, so how do we change it, right? So, so the question is, how does how do we influence Medicaid? Where, for example, I think it's a worthwhile mm -hmm. program. Where again, as you become self-sufficient, you actually get more. You know, in theory, the same benefit for a little bit more. So, if your child needs medication, they're going to get it. So you can go to your job, mm -hmm. or you, if you need childcare, or whatever it may be. As opposed, to every time you actually make a step up the ladder, they pull you back down. Right. You know, th that's what I, I struck. I mean, I, it doesn't make I love sense. It. And does it should it? come from. I'm yeah. sorry. It should come yeah. from organizations like you saying, right. "Look, it. Here's how we're going to reform mm -hmm. it, so we can again the money that you're using local tax dollars, we get people to where we want them to go, right. which is again to be self-sustaining, but again, still getting the need they that the, that the town or the government should be mm -hmm. providing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's what I would love to be able to get all these organizations together mm -hmm. and say, "How do we actually do that?" Especially if the federal government's not going to, you know, they're already cutting. I know there's issues, there's many strings about Medicaid, and mm -hmm. I understand some of the things you have dealing with the state. So then how do we change it at the local level? Yeah, I mean, I think. to put you I, on a spot, but I think, yeah. you know, I think that's what I, out of this, <clears throat> is that I'd love to be able to get all these organizations together and say, okay, you know what? The town is providing whatever it may be, mm -hmm. and here is our plan to get, you know, as we all work together, here's the friendly handoff for this, here's the friendly handoff. So I have a nice little, maybe it's not a flow chart, so I apologize if I'm simplifying it, that I know that when we, because again, when we go out and talk to people, we see people who you probably don't even know that could use your services. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're, you know, that's what, you know, we spend the money, there's pe so many people who need those services that aren't getting them. Right. I appreciate you making a comment about outreach. Mm -hmm. I think that's how we find out who really needs the services, as opposed to folks coming into your office or a referral. Absolutely. We actually got to go find them. Mm -hmm. So I, I know there's a whole lot into one, but I, you know, right. I, I think I talk about yeah, the go right ahead. Yeah. Department, but we provide a large number of outreach services in the Enfield office as well. So we have community support um, folks who provide um, assistance with finding, finding housing, getting financial assistance, getting to you know the soup kitchen, getting the other basic needs that they have. We have an assertive community treatment team here in Enfield. Um, that also provides a doctor, a nurse, and right. various service employment services on the team, all trying to get people to be as independent as they can be. So there are a large number of outreach services as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I really think that as a community, we can come together to kind of, you know, focus on some of these issues. The, the challenging part that you mentioned is the medication, right? right? So how do you make changes with pharmaceutical companies who are gonna charge way too much for a medication that a family needs? Um, you know, you we- You do it by exactly what you're saying, right? right? You do right. exactly what we're saying, yeah, by you saying, yeah. listen, here's our issue. Right. And right. this individual, here's a great case study who's mm -hmm. got promoted to a job, doing everything we want them to do, mm -hmm. using the tax dollars where they're supposed to. Oh, by the way, they're gonna jack up her, her, her child's needed medication by $200 a month. 
whatever right. it may be. Right, or the child care services. Right, you got we. It's funny. We, you know how based we, on income. Yeah. Right, you know how we talk about in generalities as opposed right. to saying, look, boom, this is what's really happening. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's amazing once you actually put that out there. I bet there's some pharmaceutical companies that say, well, I don't really want that bad press. I want to actually work with these mm-hmm. local organizations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's all I, you know, yeah, I'd love to yeah. be able to start doing that. So we actually yeah, start putting all the, all the sort of conversation to pen to paper and start putting some real change, especially because <laughs> I think we can make change in Medicaid at the local level to help people who really want to be self-sustaining mm-hmm. without penalizing them because they want to be. Right. And I think that's the, the mm-hmm. backwardsness mm-hmm. of it, so to speak. Right. And the other population really is we have individuals that go back to work, but their health care right. plans, right, have right. high deductibles. Exactly, yeah. They can't, you know, so they, you know, in essence don't have insurance unless it's a, a very serious issue or they're in the hospital. <clears throat> and how do those families afford to get the health care for their needs? So they can come to organizations like ours, which right. we have sliding fee. It's based on income. Yep. We do have the ability to waive it even lower um, based on need. And, you know, with our, um, our creating family medicine here in Anfield, those individuals also can get walked down if their health care needs are not getting met, get walked down to our first floor to see a provider because we're worried about their physical health. Thank you for, again. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you, Councilor Strother. I just have a, a quick question. Um, you mentioned that the increase for services is up 42 percent about four years ago. Mm-hmm. So the lion's share of what you're dealing with addiction is the opiates, right? So I'm just curious. Do you ever have issues with addiction or problems with people? Uh, not just opiate addictions, but marijuana. Is that ever a problem? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, we serve, so we have a methadone clinic and we treat met with medication assisted treatment, the opiates, but we're also treating people with substance addictions, marijuana, cocaine, crack, mm. um, any number of substances. Um, they're also, you know, we, what we say co occurring, and we're providing services Great. for them as well. But mm-hmm. I'm glad to hear that because, you know, so often I hear people say, you know, marijuana is not a problem. And I find it ironic that you're the professionals, you're dealing with this. And in Hartford today at the state capitol, we're talking about legalizing marijuana. I know. Yes. I know. Yeah, marijuana is the number one use of, for adolescents that we yeah. treat. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Mangini and Councilor Bosco. <clears throat> Uh, Thank you for the level of funding, by the way, and thank you for all your services. The question that I have, though, yours is the largest request, 36,000 plus. What do you attribute that to? Is it... (laughs) Sorry about that. Okay. (laughs) Is it um, salaries? Is it um, supplies? I mean, I don't want a complete breakdown, but where's the bulk of this money Use, what is the bulk used for? Well, um, there's not a simple answer. I mean, our clients have very complex needs. Um, so it costs a lot to provide the services that we provide. So salaries? We have to pay our providers. Okay. Yeah. We, yeah. We have, we, this is a very intense labor market. This is a very competitive labor market. So, yes, we do have to, we have to pay, you know, a living right. wage to our employees. Yeah. Right. The majority right. of our budget is for paying our direct staff. Oh, so okay, okay. Yeah. So you, you're getting a chunk of it through the grant through Town of Enfield. Mm-hmm. Is there other monies that you um, are recipients of somewhere else, maybe? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. 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 yeah, I would hope so. Yeah, right. yeah. We, oh my um, yeah. we have a number of, of state and federal grants. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, certainly with that, when you don't spend um, the money based on how they designate you're supposed to spend it, you pay it back, right? Okay. And in Connecticut, that goes into the general fund. Um, and then with federal funds, you know, it's, it's, the, same, it's the same deal. Um, they, our funders basically say this is what you can do with this money and, and line item by line item. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we're always looking at how we can um, it's hard to be flexible about if one program is underspent and another program needs the money, how to transfer that. It's very difficult from an accounting perspective. Thank you. Councilor Bosco. <clears throat> Again, I don't you know, I don't want to sound like a jerk, but mm-hmm. um, you know, we gotta ask these tougher questions. Sure. What is your ratio of savings to your operating budget? 
And then if you can't answer it, you can get it to town manager. And then I got one other question. I should have asked the other ones, and I hope that they'll respond to the town manager after with this. So if they if they watch this, mm -hmm. um, do you own your buildings or rent them? Rent. Yeah. Both. Yeah, we oh. both. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the ones in Enfield, we um, it's a combo of lease. So our largest building on Hazard Avenue is a lease. We lease yep. that building. Mm -hmm. um, but the clubhouse, which is the second one clubhouse on Enfield Street, it's where we started um, many 32 years ago when Sharon and I came. Mm -hmm. um, we, we worked out of that office. Um, we do own that one. OK, do you pay property tax on that one? Or are you exempt? I don't know. I don't know. We'd have to if check. you could find out. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I hate to yeah. say it, all that is taxpayer yeah. money. If someone's Absolutely. exempt on a piece of property and they're saving five thousand dollars a year in taxes and we give them five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars we're really giving them an extra five thousand mm -hmm. dollars so um yeah I, and i hope that anyone that's watched you know the other people that came before you right. when when they go answer what the ratio is of savings to uh mm -hmm. Uh, right. operating budget if they could give that answer to the town manager's office because again mm -hmm. it all comes down to money and you know that the sad part of this is is we're responsible for other people's money the taxpayers money mm -hmm. and you know someone may not like this one or that one but we have to vet this out and mm -hmm. and make sure that everything's more to need now than than want Absolutely. thank you and we will get you um, the answer to your first question. I can tell you, we operate on a very, a, very, both, yeah. very slim, very margin. very thin margin. Yeah. yeah. Councilor Hamler. Um, you provide a lot of medical services. Are you able to get reimbursement from state or or um, private insurance? At this point, we are getting reimbursement from the state from for Medicaid and um, are just launching into negotiating contracts with the commercial carriers. Okay. Good luck, good luck with that. Yeah. Good it's, luck. It's an uphill yes, battle. Yes, I know it has. Good luck. Uphill battle. I'll say very. Anything else? If thank any you call, anything, yeah, thank, thank you, you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your Okay. Um, Amplify, formerly Northern, uh, North Central Region Mental Health. Um, and I apologize if I ruined your name. Marcia DeFore, Executive Director. All right. All right. See? <laughs> I'll end on a high note. It's actually Marsha, but you're close. I've had my name butchered worse than that before. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome very much. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So thank you for having me. Um, my name is Marsha DeFore. I'm the executive director of Amplify, formerly North Central Regional Mental Health Board. We are one of five Connecticut be regional behavioral health action organizations charged by the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to act as their community partner for planning, education, and advocacy to address the behavioral health needs of children and adults in your, your community. Our members include people in recovery, families, providers of behavioral health services, and members of coalitions that are concerned about mental wellness and preventing, treating, and responding to substance misuse in our communities. So the purposes um, for our use of town funding include um, are threefold. Um, one is to ensure effective prevention initiatives as well as quality treatment and support services are provided to Enfield residents to identify local priority issues and resource needs, and to address gaps and barriers in the service system, and then to provide information about behavioral health services to the general public so that people in need of services may be more likely to seek and have access to needed treatment and support services. Every year, we conduct a regional services priority review using collected data surveys, focus groups, and interviews with people in recovery, family members, community behavioral health providers, and coalition med members, for example, your local prevention council um, led by Jean Howey, and local other local referral organizations. Um, we present those results to DEMAS, to state officials, and to the legislature, and those uh, reviews are used to set statewide priorities for the next state biennial budget as well as federal resources that come to Connecticut. 
Um, we also use those reviews to stimulate development of new and needed services. So for example, information and advocacy to address critical issues such as opioid use overdose, suicide, vaping, problem gambling, and substance misuse. So we're the fiduciary for federal funding for Enfield's local prevention council for their um, state uh, opioid use disorder um, grant. We're also the fiduciary for next year's local prevention council grant focused on strategies to address vaping among our youth. Um, and then we represent Enfield in the state, statewide drug and alcohol prevention task force that's focused on prevention, treatment, and recovery, um, support strategies to address addiction that is um, ad uh, addition, addiction issues facing Enfield residents. Um, we also want to address the root causes of addiction and, among Enfield youth, and so we've recently formed an anxiety work group to study and recommend strategies for addressing um, a growing um, emergence of anxiety among our school youth. In our last review, we highlighted the need for affordable housing with supportive services to Enfield residents um, with mental health and addiction challenges, and we highlighted to the state disparities in our region, especially the lack of options for Enfield residents um, for affordable and supportive housing services. Um, we're also concerned about um, services for older adults, and we're excited that you are creating a new position um, in your social services department focusing on older adults and look forward to working with that, that person. Um, we have grant funding for identifying and providing education about ADA transportation resources for individuals with disabilities, older adults, and veterans. Sometimes we're highlighting the strengths of our local communities um, and encouraging other parts of the state to learn from you. So for example, um, in transforming and expanding Connecticut's behavioral health crisis response system, Enfield is really a leader in our region. Um, and I've asked Jean Howie to share at an upcoming meeting about, uh, of crisis responders about how Enfield is working with their police, EMS, social services, and the faith community um, to respond as a caring community to residents in crisis. You really are a model in that area. Um, and then we provide resources and information to the general public. I, public, I publish a weekly newsletter uh, highlighting educational and advocacy opportunities. We also promote mental health first aid as a means of educating the general public about how to understand and respond to people with mental health issues, as well as a congregation assisted program for problem substance use and gambling. Our funding request is always based on um, a, a seven cents per capita rate. Um, so our request this year was for $3,125. I don't think Enfield has ever funded us at that level. Um, we're grateful for what you are able to provide. Um, but I do <coughs> want to mention that we dist distribute over $12,000 in federal funds to Enfield um, to, for addressing substance misuse issues in your community. And I want to thank you for um, supporting Amplify over the years and uh, your ex the excellent resources that you provide to your community residents. Thank you very much. Any questions? Councillor Sakala. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have, are you located in Enfield? We're located, our office is in Hartford. We cover 37 towns, including Enfield. Okay. And so how do you do the outreach in Enfield? Is it, I mean, do, do you come meet with people? Is it over the phone? Both. So we have, we have um, our region is divided into catchment area councils. And so um, the catchment area council that serves Enfield actually meets in Enfield. Um, we work very closely with the members of the Second Wind Clubhouse, um, people in recovery who um, we think it's important for their voice and their influence to be heard at the state level in terms of what's really needed for people who are struggling with mental health and addiction. So we meet with those folks, um, as well as we work very closely with your local prevention council. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Bosco? I guess you answered one of my I, questions. I know what you're going to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but the standard question that everyone's going to get asked. Yeah, yeah. So I, I will have to get you that information. OK, thank you. Thank you. Just, do you get state funding, or is it federal and local? Actually, it used to be state funding. Um, the state actually eliminated all of our funding um, several well, years did. ago. Um, we are now, we have federal funding from the, the Demas Block Grant. 
So, <laughs> so the state's considering expanding gambling in the state, legalizing marijuana, vaping, which again was supposed to cure the cigarette uh, right. addiction, and yet. They're, they cut your funding to be able to actually address those issues that we have to address with our citizens. Right. So, I mean, makes a lot of sense. So, you know, in all of our legislative advocacy, and we're at a lot of the hearings to talk with legislators, you know, our focus is, you know, some of these things you're going to do because you want the revenue. Right. But if you don't reinvest that money in prevention and treatment services, um, you, you're, you're just. Right. We know what, what's going to happen. So. Um, we will continue to advocate on those on that level for you this. guys lobby the is your organization lobby the state for some of the work that you do so 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 i'm just curious you know i mean i think what you do is great but you can see my point right i mean they're legalizing all this stuff and then we're going to make you have funding to actually deal with it but they cut your funding to actually to deal with it they right. Pay, you know right so i have to admit it, it, i struggle a little bit it's with a Conundrum, right. yes. Right. I mean, I mean, do you guys take advocacy? You said ab advocacy. I mean, for example, Council of Spazements and marijuana. Would you guys do you guys take positions on that, or you just simply deal with what you deal with? So I think the position that we'll take on marijuana um, is that you know we see it going forward. It's it's almost a train that's already past the station. But what do you do to make sure that you keep people safe given that? So you know. What is the age that's legal? Um, what protect you know what what you know we can work with communities in terms right. of ordinances. You know where are the places where people can purchase marijuana? What do you do about um, helping the police force to figure out what to do about um, intoxicated driving? I mean, there's all kinds of issues that have to be addressed if indeed Connecticut is going to pass legislation right. that legalizes marijuana. All right. No, great answer. Appreciate it, Councilor Spazza. Just real quickly, one other thing you left out, you have to figure out how how old the people are, how we're going to regulate. How about if we don't legalize it? Would that solve the problem? You know, I think it would be great if we don't legalize it, but I think it's going to happen. Well, um, it, it might happen, but, you know, I think the question is when we legalize something for the sake of revenue, and I've heard from other mental health professionals here tonight that it is a cause for concern. It is. I Absolutely. find that disingenuous, I guess. We'll leave it at that. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you will see me at public hearings talking with folks about how best to handle this. I mean, we, we, uh, we, we're not lobbyists. Um, right. we, we're part of an organization that has a lobbyist, um, but we go to hearings as educators for legislators, and they do listen to us. Um, but this is really a train that's left the station. It's how to keep people as safe as possible, given yep. what's, what's going forward, unfortunately. Appreciate it. Councilor Bosco. How many FL residents do you uh, help? So, you know, that's kind of a, a guarded question because our purpose is to help all of your residents. I, I understand. Right. So we don't provide direct services. All I care about is people from Enfield. We're using Enfield money. I don't really right. care about Harford. I don't care about East Windsor or any other town. I want to know how many people from Enfield are actually getting help with Enfield taxpayer dollars. Like I says, I don't care about the rest of the state. Right, no, but what I'm saying back to you is because we don't provide direct services, our purpose is to provide services to your entire community. So all of your residents, I believe, benefit from the kinds of services we provide to promote mental wellness and prevention of substance misuse. So you really don't have Enfield customers then, or clients? We have, we have volunteer members from Enfield, but we don't have, we don't provide direct services. So I'm not a counselor. I don't have counselors on my staff. I work with people who want to work as advocates, and I work with your coalition members. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay, up next I have the Community Health Center. Yvette Highsmith Francis, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. And Good evening. Welcome. If the button's red, uh, title, and the floor is yours. Welcome. It's red. It's mine. Good evening. Um, I am Yvette Highsmith Francis, 
Regional Vice President with Community Health Center, Inc., and am before you tonight to say thank you um, for your support of our Mary Lou Strom Primary Care Center right around the corner where we provide comprehensive outpatient health services to our community's most vulnerable residents. Um, those comprehensive services include medical, dental, and behavioral health. Um, more than 80%, about 82% of the patients that we see in the practice are living below 200% of the federal poverty level, and so are either uninsured or underinsured. And the uh, support from the town has allowed us to provide care to individuals who have no insurance coverage um, to make sure that they have access to the health services that they need. We take care of the entire family, so from infants to seniors, and really look to provide as much um, of the health services that folks need in one location. So in addition to medical, dental, behavioral health, we also have chiropractic services, a podiatrist, a diabetes educator, and a registered dietitian. Um, because of the types of chronic health issues that our patients present with, those are the, the health care services that seem to be the most beneficial. Um, again, you know, the support of the town has really helped families that would not even be able to afford our sliding fee scale. So we do have a sliding fee scale that based on income and family size can discount down to sometimes as low as $5, but believe it or not, some families do not have the resources to even pay that. Um, and so the, the town has really um, allowed for those individuals to not forego health services, because if our residents are not healthy, they will not be able to be gainfully employed, Young people will not be engaged students in our school system, and it's just sort of a vicious cycle. So um, we really appreciate the support as a federally qualified health center. So we um, have met about 65 criterion from the federal government that says the Thompsonville area that we are located in is a medically underserved area. And so we are allowed to be there to meet that unmet need. One of the benefits of that is discounted pharmacy services. So we were talking earlier about how challenging prescription costs are. So for our patients, they are able to access, if they do not have any insurance coverage, um, medications at the government wholesale cost because of our distinction as a federally qualified health center. And that has really made a huge difference in individuals and families not having to make um, the difficult financial choice about whether or not they're able to get medications. Another benefit of our practice is that we work really aggressively to make sure that everyone who presents as uninsured or underinsured sits down with our specialist for benefits and actually goes through the affordable health exchange process because sometimes people are eligible for the expanded Medicaid and they don't know it. Or they don't have a computer or they don't have the confidence to kind of go through the health exchange and to identify that maybe um, there is a plan that they could afford. And so we really work to make sure that anyone who doesn't have insurance coverage gets it because our being able to um, waive down their cost or, you know, using some support from the town to pay for those services does not follow them to the pharmacy. It doesn't follow them to a specialist, um, you know, and, and we want to make Make sure that that families are covered. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Mangini. Thank you. Thank you for your service to our community. Thank you. Just um, curiously, um, nothing else. You're looking for double of what you had last time. Is there a reason for that? Is it increase in pricing? No, increase in uninsured. Oh. Okay. Yes, and um, and realizing you know we we always do our best to make do with the, the dollars from the town, um, but did need to put our ask in, in terms of what we are seeing with the um, increase in uninsured. So our uninsured patients last year increased by 8%. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Bosco. Well, I got the two standard questions that I asked everybody. Okay. One is, do you know what you have in a 
the bank compared to your operating budget, and mm -hmm. if you don't, then you get it to them. Sure. Uh, second, do you do you own a building or do you rent the building? So we are currently leasing the building. Okay. So we're we're right around the corner yeah. here. Yeah, I know where you are. Um, we are looking for another location that I hope to own, um, but we are currently we've we've been here since 2007, and we've been leasing that same space since then. Now again, I I apologize ahead of time because I don't want to sound like a jerk, but. I thought we had this Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. that was supposed to, everyone was supposed to be insured. And the state of Connecticut has their exchange where all these people are supposed to be insured, and why aren't they insured? Cost. And so um, if, yeah, you, if you it, don't. It's, it, I, I thought that yeah. if you couldn't afford it, you got it. Um, no, that's not true. Um, you know, we do work to, as I stated earlier, I have a, we call it an access to care specialist, which is an individual that really helps people go through that application process. And there are a good number of people who are eligible for the expanded Medicaid, but we also have lots of working poor um, who don't qualify for expanded Medicaid, but do not have the additional income to pay a $200 a month premium for one of those plans. Well, the problem is I know a lot of people that could afford it and just don't want it. That's different. And, 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 I don't and, see and, them. And, and, and that, that, that's another part of yeah. the problem. Yeah. Is, oh, why, why do I need to get insurance? I'm yeah. healthy. Yeah. You know, so someone else can pay for me when I get sick. But so we don't we it, don't typically see that from our, our patients. Um, I, I respect what you're saying, um, but w that's not who we're seeing. We're really seeing people who just cannot afford it. Thank you. If you can get that question earlier. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Moving on to Enfield Homefront, team of St. Raymond of Penafort. I'm not going to try to ruin your last name. Ro Robert Ataya. All right, look at that. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Mercik. I'm with the Enfield Homefront team along with Bob Ataya. Um, we are board members on our Enfield Homefront team. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's out of St. Adalbert and St. Patrick's Church here in Enfield, and um, they uh, do a lot to assist us, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, what is Homefront? If you're not aware, Homefront is a community-based, volunteer-driven home repair program. We provide free repairs um, to low-income homeowners, enabling them to remain in their homes with improved quality of life. The Homefront organization is a regional nonprofit based out of Stamford, Connecticut, which assists us with low-cost materials, administration, and insurance for our projects. The Enfield Homefront team, who we are, our board is comprised of around 10 local residents who volunteer their time to prepare for our one-day blitz of home repair every year. We are supported out of the parish of St. Raymond of Penafort, which consists of St. Patrick and St. Adalbert's churches here in Thompsonville. Our volunteer roster is comprised of roughly 200 people from Enfield and surrounding communities. We've been working in Enfield for over 20 years, and each year have worked on no fewer than three projects, and some years as many as five, on the first Saturday in May each year. <coughs> to date, we've completed projects to make the homes of 70 families warm, safe, and dry in the Enfield community. We're not doing extreme home makeover. Some of you might be familiar with that. That's not what we're doing. Rather, we achieve quality of living repairs for people um, at no cost to approved homeowners. Beneficiary families are screened by the Homefront organization for eligibility before we sign on to help them. They have to qualify as low income and own the home. We don't work on rental units. We work with the Enfield Office of Community Development to identify Enfield residents in need as well as partnering with them to help families who may have more need than our resources can help. How do we do this? Um, we attempt to complete all of our work on the first Saturday in May every year. We're entirely volunteer driven. Our volunteer teams are comprised of professional contractors who donate their time and talents and usually tools um, to help us. We're also very fortunate to have a large population of retired professionals as well as a very large group of people who come out to help us to do whatever is asked and provide the labor to get our projects done. It's really quite an amazing process. 
Um, we also solicit local businesses. Most notable is Marvin of Enfield, which was um, formerly A.W. Hastings over on Moody Road. And they have donated a large number of materials as well as provided staff that comprise one of our teams each year for the last 16 years. They've been very involved with us. Um, what are our costs? Our costs are that uh, we need to pledge $2,750 per home that we work on each year. And as I said before, um, we work on usually three homes a year, every year. Um, and this fee we pay to the home front organization down in Stamford that I mentioned. And it covers the insurance for the volunteers that work on site that day, as well as giving us access to discounted construction materials for our projects. Our administrative costs are fairly minimal. Um, they consist of paper uh, for volunteer mailings and postage for those. Uh, we make every effort to get that money or um, items donated from local businesses that are willing. And additionally, the administrative staff at St. Raymond of Penafort Parish help us out by collecting the mail for us and also answering and fielding phone calls on our behalf. And then the other administrative is that 10 member board that I mentioned, we do what we can when we can. Um, additionally, we feed our volunteers on any given work day when they come out to work. We uh, need to keep them upright. Um, we usually consist of, you know, light breakfast, a lunch, and snacks and beverages throughout the day. Again, we try to solicit that through donations, getting that, that food donated by local businesses, restaurants. Um, but if we do not have um, the full amount in donations, we do need monies to purchase that to make sure that these people are taken care of. And who is footing this bill? Um, we are completely funded with donations and grants. And we've worked over the 20 years. We have um, done different things. We've solicited funds from local businesses and individuals through mail campaigns, uh, just asking outright for donations. We've received proceeds from benefit concerts and um, special collections at, through St. Raymond of Penafort Parish. And we have also received um, a number of different grants. And we have specific information on that um, in the past. But we really are here this evening. We believe that our goals, the Enfield Homefront team, closely align with those of um, the Greater Together Community Funds and Social Services in that we not only help the need in our community, but we bring community members together to meet that need. We form teams out of anyone who's willing to come on out and help us. And any monies granted to our organization will be used to foster teamwork and a sense of community, as well as improving the quality of life of those people in need in Enfield. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Any questions? Councilman Bosco? Well, I, I think I probably know what your answer is going to be, but what do you have in a kitty compared to operating expenses? And uh, well, I know you don't pay rent, but I, I got to ask the same question to everyone to be fair. So or, we, we currently, my name's Bob Atia, we currently have six, six to $7,000 in our kitty. Um, we are required to make a pledge of 8275 for three sites. Our goal was to try to get four. Um, so uh, our savings to budget. I, I, uh, right, yeah, yeah, I guess now, three. you know, I mean, you have that money, so that, that's gone. So that yeah, leaves you with right. right. you know, a couple exactly. hundred bucks. So right. uh, th we're, that's why I just want to know what you got for rears. savings compared to operating. You know, we're, you're probably in a negative right we now. We are in the negative right but now. But you know, I'm asking everyone the same exact question. So if you could just when you get, three. get it done, get it down to yep. Tom Andrews' office and... Sure. If it shows a negative, it's a negative. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know what you had for expenses last year. Thank you. Councilman Kiner, then Councilman Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a, a disclaimer. Uh, I worked with this organization many years ago, and um, I think you, you made one error where you were talking about uh, these volunteers. Um, many of these people are they're, they're licensed tradesmen. Yes. Uh, they worked hard during the five days of the week, and they, they work on Saturday. But oftentimes, they don't finish their job. They do come back on Sunday the following week. And, uh, you know, oftentimes we, we talk about wanting to see this town uh, going back to the time when we were called the All-American Town. And this is certainly a, a step in the right direction. Uh, it, it's just absolutely heartwarming uh, to see these, these men and women 
oftentimes 100 or, or more, uh, descending upon these three to, to five homes um, and, and make repairs, uh, almost rebuilding the homes in, in some cases. And of course, that also um, is an attribute for the community itself. Um, I also serve on the blight committee. And um, oftentimes, these houses are blighted. And you're certainly improving not only the, uh, the home for that individual, but for the community as well. And I certainly, I for one, appreciate all the work that you guys do. And uh, just keep it up. And I hope that we can, uh, we can help you guys. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Spadaza. Thank you. The 2750 you have to pledge to the corporate office in Stanford, that's for the whole day, right? It's not per house, not per project. It is per project on that day. So and how many uh, projects would you have on that day? We generally do three to five. So this year we've pledged three. 2750 per home. Correct. So Even we owe them. Even if the repairs in that home are going to take an hour and a half and there's three guys, it's still 2750. We, we, do, um, we don't do small projects. We, we spend the rest of the year trying to figure out projects that are extensive enough that we have the, the okay. staff that can handle it. Um, you know, no, we don't try to take too big a bite. But um, you know, as Mr. Kiner mentioned, sometimes there is stuff that goes beyond that one day. We try to get it completed in that one day. Okay. But these are generally very large projects: um, window replacement, roof repair, siding repair. Um, okay. Any? Uh, All right. Thank the, you. The thank you. Councilor Kiner. Yeah. Thank you. Just just one question. I seem to remember reading somewhere is that isn't there a program that you work in conjunction with veterans and Home Depot? Uh, can you? Tell us a little bit more about how veterans are helped. Sure. Uh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, this year we're, we're planning on doing three veteran sites. Um, we've uh, Home Depot has a, um, a, a national level grant that the home front based in Stamford applies for, and um, if if they um, are awarded that and we happen to be doing a veteran grant, then um, they basically can provide more material for that particular site. So where we might be replacing three or four windows, but we'd really like to replace uh, 12 or 15, the funds would become available and we would allocate our resources accordingly. Just curious, if we were to allocate money, would we be able to get some before and after pictures of what this accomplished? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, we have that. You we do, just I have an average, we weren't allowed to bring a phone. Right. Yeah. So I have an average three to five uh, houses in Enfield here. Just curious. Real, I mean, well, what recent, any recent homes maybe? I don't know if you can say or not, but. Oh. Um, I, I would just say if you Google Journal Inquire with Homefront. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are, and we do There's have a Facebook page. plenty of them. Um, yep. The Enfield Home Front team does have a Facebook page, and there are pictures of our projects. Sorry, there are pictures oh, of our yeah. projects um, up on our Facebook page, and you can see it's usually day of work and team photos on site at each um, location. And I'm assuming it, uh, there's certain criteria for a homeowner to apply. Yes, they have to um, meet a, a low income level, and they have to um, be a homeowner. We don't do rentals, um, you know, or do, uh, yeah. Okay. They're, and they're extensively vetted through the Stanford organization. That's the other thing that that organization gets us is they do the um, review of the financials and make sure that this person is actually eligible. And just curious, last question. So the the, the, the contractors, the volunteers, where do I mean, do you do you put that on your web? I mean, to show that some of those folks who do do actually donate their time. I mean, do you actually put it somewhere on your website to highlight the names or the or the companies that help you out? Uh, a lot of times, the individuals and the companies want to be on the QT. I understand. Fair and enough. and yeah. so we try to respect that. But I can say, I'm going to mention one, Trianos, um, uh, among right. others that have been absolutely incredible. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We're obviously well behind schedule, so we apologize. The general meeting is going to be a little late. Uh, and Phil Food Shelf. Kathleen, we are uh, about, what, 20 minutes behind? I'm going to blame the town manager on this. We're going to blame the town manager. <laughs> for the record, for the record. Welcome. How you doing? Welcome. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. There we go. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathleen Suveny, and I'm the executive director for the Enfield Food Shelf, which is right over here at 96 Alden Avenue. I'm also an Enfield resident. I want to thank the town council for your service, because as much as I depend on volunteers, this town depends on all of you as well. This is a great opportunity for me to talk a little bit about the Enfield Food Shelf and its programs. I'm really honored to present alongside all these great organizations that have come up before me to talk about how we can focus on making Enfield a better place together. Um, we are asking to continue your support for our rental assistance as you have in the past so we may maintain and expand our services. This is important because in Hartford and Talon counties alone, there are 127,000 people suffering from food insecurity based on data provided through the University of Connecticut College of Agriculture and Natural uh, Resources. Enfield falls in the bottom 25% of Connecticut towns for food security amongst its residents. This makes Enfield residents some of the highest at-risk population in the state of Connecticut for food insecurity. Based on the federal poverty level income brackets, there are an estimated 7,000 people here in Enfield who would qualify or, and or could use some form of food assistance, excluding those in the Alice category that uh, you heard about earlier. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Enfield Food Shelf, how we approach that. Um, for the last 52 years, Enfield Food Shelf has been providing food assistance to Enfield families in need. In 2019, we served more than 2,100 registered Enfield residents just in our traditional weekly program. Many of you guys, thank you so much for coming and helping uh, to serve, and um, the, then um, across many more that are across our other programs, and this need continues to grow. In the month of January alone, we registered 96 new shoppers for our weekly food assistance, which is all Enfield residents. Um, in 2019, our Enfield Food Shelf volunteers worked more than 32,000 hours and successfully distributed the equivalent of 530,000 meals across all of our programs, partnerships, and collaborations. That's a 3% increase over 2018. Although that seems like a lot, when you look at the overall numbers, it's about 20% if we were really going to alleviate hunger. In Enfield, you'd need about 2.9 million meals um, over the uh, annual time. Um, as times have changed and needs have grown, we've adjusted and expanded our programs and added partnerships and collaborations. As an organization, we, have strive, we are striving toward a community in which everyone has access to nutritious food through a sustainable and collaborative distribution network. This network will also provide awareness to available programs, resources for assistance, and nutrition-based education. To fulfill this vision, we continue to enhance our weekly, monthly, and emergency food assistance programs. We maintain more than 16 partnerships and collaborations, helping to extend our food assistance network beyond our traditional weekly program, and we are always looking to provide more. An example of that would be we um, provide Head Start with uh, overages that we have for bread and things like that, which has been going very well. We provide home delivery for seniors who qualify in our monthly food assistance program. We make um, nutrition, health, insurance, housing resources available at each food distribution. We provide SNAP electronic sign up at each food distribution. We help to build a healthier community by participating in local initiatives such as the Enfield Hunger Action Team and 2Gen. We work to combat senior isolation with our new Enfield Friendly Caller program. This is a new collaboration with um, the Commission on Aging and Enfield Social Services. We have a trained and licensed therapist who is a volunteer of ours who has trained volunteers to connect with our seniors here in Enfield by phone to provide them with resource information and a friendly voice on a weekly basis. Um, so we've been working with um, Cindy Guerrera to grow that program and uh, we're very excited about that. We provide a variety of opportunities for volunteers as well. I think that's something that um, gets overlooked a little bit. People are able to connect with others. They can gain work experience. They can get back on track with their community service. We have student interns that help to learn social services backgrounds. And all these people know that they, as an individual, 
can and do make a significant difference for their Enfield neighbors by making a donation of time and food and funds. Um, we're working on a new larger facility. The building is right in our parking lot, so it won't disrupt our clients too much. Um, we're hoping to expand um, and make a more positive uh, impact uh, here as we continue to work with all these agencies to um, fulfill our vision of a food secure uh, community. Um, we also help other or other organizations such as the Warming Center with um, different fundraising, joint fundraising. I do fundraising that I split with them to help them out as well because I feel like there's a lot of things that need to fall into place to help the at-risk people here in Enfield. On behalf of everyone, at the Enfield Food Shelf, I just wanted to thank the town council as well as everyone in Enfield for helping to provide us with such dedicated support over the last half century. What we do would not be possible without you, and I totally agree with uh, Mr. Kiner. This still is an all-American town. The volunteer base is incredible and wonderful, and we really can get a lot done by working together. Um, please watch for information on our open house. We're actually moving forward on our construction of our new space, so we're very, very excited about that. Everyone is welcome to come, and we hope to see you there. And I look forward to addressing any questions you have. Mr. Bosco, we have uh, voted that we have 18 months of reserves that we sustain at all times so that we could keep going for 18 months if we needed to. And we are funded basically by fundraising events, direct fundraising, and grants that I write. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilor Bosco. What is the, if you could just let the percentage, so I, we know what you got for capital. Uh, 18, oh, well, we have 18 months of reserves. Right, so, so what does that equate to percentage of your operating budget? One and a half times. One and a half times. Yeah. Councilor Mangini. I just want to say thank you. I had the privilege of serving on the board and now I'm liaison and I see the wonderful work that's being done. Um, thank you. You know, from the food shelf, servicing the people of Enfield. And it just amazes me every time I step in, um, to see the positive results, so thank you for all the hard work. Thank you very much. Councilor Muller, when are you moving? Well, um, we're hoping, we're just waiting um, for a couple things to fall into place, but hopefully we'll be starting our construction in March. I'm hoping to kind of have a soft opening in that June time frame and a larger opening toward the end of the summer. And you'll get rid of the old building, or you rent We that? will, we rent, by oh, the way. Rent. We okay. do, yes, yes, we do rent our facility. It's the same landlord, so, um, you know, he's helping to facilitate the move over there. Any other questions? Well done, thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Again, apologize, the regular meeting still hasn't started. We are still going through the special meeting. We welcome the Network Against Domestic Abuse. Karen O'Connor, welcome. Thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for having me. I was me. going to suspend the rules and make you, make you wait to the end of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Joking, go right ahead, sorry. Thank you for not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, I just want to say it is my pleasure and honor to be sitting here representing the network. Um, I want to introduce myself to you. I'm Karen Foley O'Connor. Um, I've just retired uh, being a state police sergeant for 25 years. Well, not a sergeant for 25, but uh, 25 years of service to the state police. Um, one of my passions um, while being a sworn officer was training police officers to respond to domestic violence incident with trauma-informed compassion and working to help get our victims safe. Um, <clears throat> state police and local police are now conducting lethality assessment tool um, at the scene of family violence, which um, sadly um, in Connecticut, 51% of those screens come in as high risk to be killed by their intimate partner. Um, and that meets pretty in line with the national as well. Um, Connecticut has uh, 14 to 15 domestic violence homicides a year in the state. So as a police officer coming to this position, um, it, you know, you, you, the media will pick up on a few, but it's happening more often than we realize. Um, and I come to the network with the hopes that we can keep our, our residents here in Enfield safe and get them to uh, start safe, self-sustained, lifestyle free of domestic abuse, okay? Um, I'm gonna apologize, I'm, um, 
literally have been doing this job for two weeks. So I can tell you, sir, that the answers to your questions I'm going to have to get back to you. I'm just starting to wrap my head around the budget. I, we know we do have savings, but we look at the savings in, in the same way of how long we could survive. Um, we do own uh, uh, Julie's safe house in a children's center. Um, that is our safe house, which is actually here in Enfield. And we also own um, the condo that we operate our main officer um, here in Enfield. We have been in Enfield for 35 years um, and um, our headquarters are here. Um, I, what, what our goal here at the network is to provide safe, uh, free trauma, um, inform domestic violence services to Enfield residents um, who are victims of domestic abuse. And there are several area ways that we do that. Um, we have 24-hour um, Safe Connect service through CCADV, which is then filtered to our safe house to get victims and their families into uh, safe, immediate housing. Um, but once they get into that safe, immediate housing, the goals then turn into counseling, both individual and in group, um, on many levels. Um, just Not just uh, domestic violence counseling for victims and their children, but it's also counseling to get them connected to resources in the state and here in the community, to get them out, to get them working, to get them permanent housing, um, and to get their families to a point where they're on their own um, and out of the, the safe house. Um, I was surprised when I arrived here to learn that our safe house, um, which is 15 beds, is 124% full. We have, um, on a regular basis, um, clients, victims, and families that we put in alternative housing um, at, at any given moment. Um, that was that was a kind of a surprise to me coming into town. Um, we do serve uh, uh, th two thirds of our victims that we serve come from the town of Enfield. Okay, so it is our biggest um, in our in our catchment. It's, it's our biggest um, town. Um, we also. Um, provide legal advocacy to victims in the courthouse um, post-arrest and even pre-arrest to get um, appropriate orders of protection um, from their abusers. Um, <clears throat> And then the big piece is um, the education. I know, I, again, I'm looking through, I have many grants that um, we go through um, in, in the network, to, just to add that we are we are funded by state and federal grants that are filtered through CCADV. It's about 60%. And then the other 40 is donations, um, fundraisers, and, and grants that we apply for. And we, we do apply for many, and I'm just starting to wrap my head around that in my new position. But we apply education services to all Enfield students both on the elementary level and at the high school level um, to ab about domestic violence, dating violence, um, how to deal with the stressors, stressors of domestic abuse, um, and healthy relationships, how to deal with anger. And I could just give you some numbers that um, last year, in uh, 2019, we educated um, 4,575 Enfield students educators and coaches um, about um, preventing domestic abuse and, and healthy relationships. Um, and we also housed 20 adults in Julie's house and 10 children. Now the average stay in Julie's house is about 30 to 35 days, again with the goal to get them um, out in a self-sustainable uh, residency on their own. We do have people that stay longer, families that stay longer, and some that are shorter. Um, again, our goals are, are to provide immediate service um, to victims of domestic violence in Enfield for sustainable cell, uh, self safe and self-sufficient um, lives in the community to be free of domestic abuse. Um, as far as our services outside of Julie's house, we still provide the counseling, uh, group and individual, and again, assistance with some sometimes without the need for housing. Um, and in 2019, we best benefited 375 Enfield victims and children. Um, so again, thank you. I noticed that last year you guys did provide us with grant money. Um, that grant money really plays a big role in us being able to uh, train your, stu your the youth of Enfield, um, which is where we want to start to begin the healthy relationship and hopefully um, get a handle on domestic abuse. Um, we did ask for slightly more this year. Um, that reason is because we did notice that we our, our population in Enfield is growing, and that was 40 more individuals than we um, we helped in 2019. Uh, I, 
thank you very much for letting me be here. Again, I'm honored and proud um, to be the executive director of something that I believe so passionately about. And um, I hope that you'll consider that. And I'll provide the information to your town, uh, to the, it was to your town manager? Yes. yes. Um, tomorrow, as soon as I get my, that, that I will. Well, welcome to your new job. Thank you so yeah. much. And again, I think you, as long as everyone else, have done a very good job of advocating for your group. So very well done. I said two quick questions. So you mentioned sort of training. What about teaching them how to report it? So, so you know, obviously sometimes, I'm, I'm not certainly no expert, but I know sometimes a lot of it goes unreported. And then, of course, it gets to a level that, you know, you, know, you, you have real, you know, you get to the, I mean, you know, those sort of things. And you mean training, you also lookouts, watch outs, those sort of things? Absolutely. This training, this, the training is about, and I, and I, I actually put this aside because I knew you would ask me, uh, it's about healthy relationships, teen dating violence, um, actually. Um, we're in the schools with this? In the schools. Right, good. Um, yeah. Another big thing is Enfield, it, it, the football team did sign on to Coaching Boys to Men, which is a program that we're trying to push statewide. Um, it involves time, and, and as a, a coach myself, we mm -hmm. teach these athletes to be aggressive. Um, I, I'm, my kids all play hockey, and that, that's certainly a part of that. So I'm a huge advocate of that, and I'm actually working with uh, my community educator to look at some other national models of coaching women to be strong. Um, so we're trying to target that group. We're also, so we're, we're training coaches. Um, so we, on the lower level, we're look, talking about health, meaning the elementary level, talk about healthy relationships, what to do with anger and how to manage anger, and, and what, what to do, when you need to talk about it and how to tell, if you will. And then at the high school level, we're really, really addressing dating violence and what to do in those circumstances, whether you're involved in it or you suspect it. So, so uh, real quick, so we had the, I'm going to ask about the grant where we got to prevent homelessness. Is this one of the things where there's a friendly handoff if someone unfortunately gets into a situation where they may have to go to, you know, to the, to a, to the safe house, but then eventually we can hand them off to the program that, you know, works. Is that part of this as well? So meaning that was part of the reason why we went for that grant was to be able to do some of the things like that. So I'm not sure how, how you can oh, talk to Cindy afterwards. Cause okay, that's one great. of the, we've been, it's one of those I, things we've taught. We, we have a grant that we actually, uh, helping people prevent homelessness where you know again some this is obviously a situation where someone may lose their home because of domestic violence obviously the situational homeless is our, our priority there also is a program um um rapid rehousing and interestingly enough and i can't give you enfield specific but interesting enough then the network is the second smallest catchment of advocacy agencies in the state of connecticut and so far our safe house has rap used to utilize the rapid rehousing program the most in the state so we really are um, getting people out there. And again, it's not, we're looking, the rapid rehousing is specifically to getting into something more permanent quicker. Uh, so. Very good. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you so you much. Thank you. All right, now there was one. Regular meeting is still not ready, so we apologize for folks on TV. EFRC, please come up. ERFC, excuse me, I apologize, ERFC. And Claire Hall is the executive director. Welcome. Just uh, name and title, make sure the red light's on. All right, I'm Claire Hall, executive director of Educational Resources for Children. Welcome. Also known as ERFC, and this is... <clears throat> Thank you, good evening. I'm David Meisels, I'm director of operations at ERFC. Thank you for having us this evening. Um, this evening we're going to talk to you because of your time also, uh, strictly about what our grant uh, ask is, is for our summer program called the Summer Escape Camp. In about four weeks we'll be back here uh, talking about our all our services that we provide the Enfield community um, in a presentation in early April. Our uh, summer escape camp has been in operation since about 1995. And we serve as children uh, from Enfield. All our, our families we serve are here in Enfield. We do invite uh, other communities, if there is space in our program, for them to also join our program. Uh, we've been, we operate and serve for over um, an average of over 125 children um, every summer, a week, every day. Uh, children can enroll for one week or seven weeks. We run a seven-week program. 
Uh, we provide a, a two different fee structures for families. Uh, we have a full pay fee as well as a fee for a free and reduced lunch. That subsidized fee is where we're asking for assistance in this grant. We subsidize every year approximately 60% six, of the children we serve in the summer. For most of the students who come in the summer for, to us for, from grades one to grades eight to grade eight are students that normally don't go to any other camps. They just, the families cannot afford the camps. The reason we exist is that parents really need us. They have to work. Many of our families are working one to two jobs, different shifts. So it allows us to serve families every day from 8 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock. And then we have extended camp. So we open at 7 for working families, and we end at 6 o'clock for working families. So we provide a full day of services for Enfield families. Dave, you want to tell about the what happens at Ellis? Summer Escape Day Camp is um, recreational. Yeah. Press, also, press the oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Better? There we go. Oh, S summer Escape Day Camp is a recreational summer program with a significant academic and educational enrichment component to it. So in addition to sports, arts and crafts, performing arts, there is a dedicated digital media program that will involve robotics, coding, uh, film creation, um, music creation, all through computer. We'll do a dedicated science program and a literacy component um, all the way through. In doing so, we help to address what could be learning loss over the course of the summer. Of course, we partner with the school district during the year, uh, providing before and after school. And we feel it's, it's part of our mission to make sure that students are coming back to school uh, at the beginning of the year ready to go, um, having, having enriched themselves through the camp programs over the course of the summer. You done? Okay, <laughs> I'll take it back. Um, one thing we do do again addressing this, uh, the summer learning loss is um, can you hear me? Because I can't hear me. Yeah, you're okay, adding, oh, good. You're um, is is really look at. What do the kids work with during the school year? We know because we work with over 300 kids that um, we know where they're coming from in the summer. Many of the students who enroll this summer are already, already parts of our pro, part of our program during the school year. So it gives us an opportunity, like Dave said, to continue the learning in total disguise because summer camp is really fun. Um, and it, that gives us a chance to, to, to reach on some of those math activities, those reading activities, um, and keep kids learning in that way. Uh, summer program also gives an opportunities for families to come together. We do family engagement activities every single week and we get a really good call for that. Parents really try to work on their schedules to be there on those, on those Fridays. Um, and it's an opportunity for them again to, to be part of uh, the whole family and work together. Any questions? Questions. <laughs> Councilor Bosco and Councilor Mangini. No, we don't have any reserves, and we own nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> yeah. So I'd like to know uh, the same question sure. I asked everybody else, and the same thing with property. Yeah. The only other question I got is, you're looking for this this fifteen thousand for this summer camp. Mm -hmm. At the end of summer camp, do you run a deficit? No, we usually make our it? we make our we usually make our budget. Our budget has been pretty well leveled. We don't serve more kids every year. We haven't been able to for about three years. So we have a, we keep our budget as fairly level. There's never anything left over. We subsidize. If there's any money left over in budget that we're projecting, we use it to subsidize our families. But but that that's that that's yeah. fine. But I'm just saying, yeah. you know, it, is this like a a loss to you? No, we have break this? even to us. We look to break even every year to start the year. It's it's a difficult program to make money on <laughs> because we, we are also a licensed camp, which means we have a lot of mandates from the state in order to keep our license. We have to we have a one to ten, one to twelve in the summer ratio with staff. So a lot of it goes to staffing in order to, to operate. 
Yeah, the, the license aspect of it is, is a real benefit for the kids, too. All of our staff are CPR first aid trained. They are all trained to handle medication and uh, medication-related issues. They're all um, mandated DCF reporters. Um, and our staff is college age and up, uh, really through retiree age. Um, we have counselor in trainings. These are our high school students, uh, mostly from Enfield High School, who will participate at no cost and work their way into potentially the youth development field if, uh, if that's where they want to head. So do you, during this summer period, do you have to hire more staff to, to do this? Does, does your staffing go up considerable or are you using staff that you have all through the year? We're fortunate. Our staff uh, continues and grows with us in the summer, um, which is very We think we retain about only 85% of the staff stays with us through summer. A lot, some of our staff go on to college or um, higher education, even in master's degrees. Some of them um, work, let's see, most of our staff, we have, do have some student um, college interns who will come and assist with us. GPS paras. Uh, and Phil Public teachers. School, yes, yeah, certified teachers, high school uh, paras, the, uh, paras that work in the uh, Enfield schools. We have a variety of different people, and they follow us, and hopefully they'll still be with us for the start of the new I year. I guess where I was going is if, if you didn't have this program, hmm. uh, you know, is, is half of your staff from the babysitting during the day through this program, or is this all more or less new staff you need to hire to run this program? Okay, first of all, we don't babysit, <laughs> just so we can make that clear. What we well, do is... My wife is, said that, too, when I used yeah. to have to watch my kids. Really? Well, we, we provide the educational activities and enrichment activities. So babysitting, the staff doesn't come to babysit. Uh, most of these are trained to work as very much like parents are trained to assist in, in different team leaders. Um, if we didn't have the program, these people would not have jobs in the summer. Because many of them are part time and they're that's, working that's, with other that's my, that was Absolutely, my they, they would they would lose their jobs. And most of our employees are from Enfield. So, yeah. Council Mangini. Thank you, thank you for your program. As you know, I know firsthand the value of this program. As a backup grandma, I've had the privilege of taking advantage of this program. There is no babysitting. There, there is nothing to do with babysitting. But I think also what people need to understand is the value of the program. The fact that without <coughs> your program, many um, children won't fit into other programs because there's no room or too costly. And in addition, many of these children will be left home unattended, and that's a fact. And I, I know, you know, firsthand, of course, that's illegal, it's wrong, but there are parents that have no choice. Right. So those children will be unsafe. And through your program, you provide not only the safety of uh, for the children, you also provide not only recreation, you, you provide the ability for these children to grow, mature, develop, socialize, and it's wonderful. And I can't thank you enough for that. And I would always support your program. Thank you. Thank you. It is a good point that we need to address is that a lot of children take care of younger children in this town. Um, we work very hard in our case management work to really meet with families and let them know the opportunities that are available and have them take advantage of it. Um, it's usually the older students that will come to us and say, I want to come to camp, but I have to take care of the four-year-old and the two-year-old so mom can work. So it does fit that, that group for sure that needs it. It also does keep kids very safe. The program started years ago because there was no program and there were kids out on the street. And that was when the program first started in 1994 uh, through the Saint, then St. Andrew's Church. On the lawn. On the lawn, yes. We, 
<laughs> I know. It's been a long time. So, so just curious, though, we do sure. have a program now. We have the Tons for Fun that the town funds. Yes. So mm -hmm. I think people got to realize we also do fund our own program. How does yes. that compete with your program? So I'm saying from the perspective, I mean, the taxpayers are funding a full program mm -hmm. you know, through to what's called Tons for Fun. Mm -hmm. So I just want people to realize that the town is actually providing a pro sure. program as well. I don't feel like we've ever competed with them. They they fill up and we fill up. <laughs> and I, that says there's a need. Um, we've never had that happen for us anyways. It's been, it fills up very quickly. Um, it operates for a full seven weeks and we even operate a program when school ends called Vacation Destination to bridge to the summer program. So it has not been a, a matter of, of um, compromise or competition for us. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you Thank being you. patient. Thank you.